Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRNAM for Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. And our top story today, global investments in sustainable funds plummet. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Bob Colley is the principal and founder of Colley ESG. Bob, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Hi, Jeff. Always, always happy to be here and talk to you. Yeah, love checking in with you. You got the pulse uh, pun intended on sustainable investing. I know you you guide and and consult the clients um, about where to invest their their products or what products to invest in. Bob, I want to talk to you now about you know we're in the midst of this. Uh, I don't want to call it a global recession, but there's definitely market volatility at least here in the states and I think elsewhere around the country around the world. And let's talk about global investment um, in sustainable funds. They they have declined uh, over the past quarter. Uh, but you're closer to this than I am. What say you? I, I, there's there's a long term trend and, a, and short term trends, as always with these things. And, and and it's it's natural when a you know recession hits, if it's a recession or at least a downturn in markets, um, people do do get scared, and, and you, you get these reactions um, to short term performance with, with any any investment categories. It, 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 the the flows will come and go. So um, there's definitely short-term fluctuations. I think the underlying long-term pattern when it comes to sustainable investing really is a maturing of the industry. So, so um, the, the flows um, perhaps will be more stable, more thoughtful. They'll be less driven by you know, short-term performance considerations or, or you know, what's trendy, what's, what's hot and being talked about, and more by some of the longer-term underlying factors. Um, but we should certainly expect to see the fluctuations, you know, both up and down in the flows over short term periods. As you know, that's that's how markets go. Yeah, markets. I mean, you know, I don't know anyone who I don't get I don't talk to people on the street and they say, well, look what the market's doing. What do you think? And, uh, you know, I, I'm a long term investor. So I say mm -hmm. overall, long term things are going to do going to go up. I mean, that's what they have done, even yeah. since the Great Recession or before the Great Depression, which luckily we were not around to experience. Bob, I have been reading about sustainable funds. How have they done relative to their peers? So, and when I say peers, traditional funds, um, have they done better, equal to, or worse? Because some of this uh, lack of flow be a lack of recognition of how some of these funds have done relative to their peers. And, and th there, I, I can give you a stack of studies that would show they're doing <laughs> okay. better. I can give you a stack of studies that show they're worse and a stack of studies that say it's the same. The, the, and, and, and a lot of that depends on the time period that you're looking at, because even though with a sustainable fund, what you're looking for are certain characteristics in terms of the nature of the investments and so on, what comes along with that is you've got sectoral biases on that. So, so if you have a period of time where you know, the old industries, that maybe the fossil fuels and so on, are having a great run. Well, sustainable funds are going to do worse. If, if tech is doing well, sustainable funds are going to do better. And, and so you can't separate the sustainability aspect from some of the, the just the sectoral um, biases that come with, with any type of investment strategy. So I, I think it is very hard to disentangle those performance patterns, certainly over the short term. The way... I look at it and the way I, I, I would recommend most investors to look at the performance questions with, with sustainable investing is, is not to look at it as a way to say this is going to add value. Certainly, you can build a case that if you, have, you know, call the sustainable transition, the energy transition, if you can call that correctly, then there's a lot of potential to add value. But that's a big if, you know, calling anything correctly and the timing of it and so on can be a tough ask. So it, I, I think sustainable investing is a lot more about how you want to be positioned with your portfolio, what you want to be invested in. I think what the studies do show is that you're not necessarily giving up a return premium in order to do that. If you're going into sustainable investing because you want something over and above the market, 
you might be disappointed, but I think there is enough evidence that would say, certainly over the long run, you're not really giving up a substantial premium in order to choose uh, a lot of these green firms. Bob, somewhere in the neighborhood of 245 new sustainable funds have come to the market. I guess there's a commitment there from the uh, from the asset managers in this space. And, and you know, you, you know, as well as I do, because you've been in the industry longer than I have, uh, have a lot more more experience in that regard. But someone doesn't build a product unless they think that they're going to get asset flow. So clearly these asset managers are committed to the market. They're creating product because they know that allocators and others will be committed to it as well. Everybody, everybody wants to, to be in this space right now. And part of it is just a defensive strategy. If, if, if you have clients that want a more sustainable type of investment portfolio and they're looking to move, well, you'd rather they move to your funds than to a competitor's fund. So, so I think everybody feels they have to offer this now, which says something about the market. Um, obviously, they're not all going to be successful as with... Um, and anything, it's the way the market works. It jumps into something and it probably overdoes the new launches and there'll be a pendulum that swings back and it'll correct and, and the, the winners will keep standing. In the long run, as I say, I think this market will mature. I think we'll see greater stability. There'll be more clarity around definitions. It'll be more clear what you're investing in. I think we'll see more, more professionalism in terms of how people go about it. And all of those things are happening, but they don't happen overnight. Um, so, it, so it's definitely still a reasonably immature market, but it's getting there. It's starting to mature. It's starting to stabilize. Bob, to that point, let's talk a little, get an update on regulation. Does, does this volatility um, and maybe some of the ebbing, I guess, curbing in fund flows, does that actually help the case for the regulation that you and I have been talking about for months and months and months, which is disclosure? Disclosure, not only from the fund companies, but also corporations about their boards, about how they do business. Does that actually help regulation, more regulation, or does it hurt potential regulation? Yeah, there is. Um, it's very easy to slip into the, the mindset that would say, oh, you know, regulation, it's regulation or the market. And, and you've kind of you view those as, as opposing forces. But, but regulation done properly is about setting the rules within which the market works. And, and so it's not about preventing the market from doing what the market does best. Um, but what it is about is preventing the market from the abuses that the, the free market will go to if it's left completely uh, un, uncontrolled. And you, 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 so it's the obvious ones like you need fraud, you need stable, um, you need good contract law and so on. You know, so that's the role of regulation to set that playing field. And when you look at the sustainable investing space at the moment, where I think there is room for the market to be better defined, it is around things like labelling products. What If you use a certain term, what does that mean? Greater standardisation there. And also standardisation around what data it is provided by companies. So if... if um, one company is providing it, its carbon footprint in one format and another company is doing it in another format. That's not good for everybody. So I think that some, some of it's just about standardizing how the reporting that people are doing is expected. So, so I think there are some smart regulations that can go on here. As always, if you, know, if you get regulation wrong, it, it can be a disruptive thing. But I, th I think that this is a space where there's a lot of room for the regulators and the, the fund firms to work together to, to find out what regulation makes sense and what's going to be best for, for investors. You know, Bob, it, it, it's almost like a, a new market is almost like raising a child. You've got to develop it, educate it, and wait for it to mature. Bob, I need to take a very quick break. I hope you like that, that metaphor or allegory, whatever it is, or however you term it. Bob, I need to take a very quick break. When we come back, a few of America's top universities disclose the diversity of their asset managers on their endowments. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control 
of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers. This free book reveals little known secrets about annuity strategies that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. Call right now for your free book. And as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free for calling Annuity General today. Call 800-504-8194. Welcome back. We're talking this morning to Bob Colley. He's principal and founder of Colley ESG. Bob, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. Oh, it's great to be here, Jeff. I'm happy to talk. Yeah, it's definitely great. And let's continue our conversation about sustainable investing. And I want to drill down on uh, the top U.S. universities. They have what are called endowments, and those are usually funds that are used for capital improvements. It can be like you know building a new um, auditorium uh, and helping enroll students. I mean, there's a, a ton of reasons why people have endowments. It seems as though, however, Bob, that few of these institutions disclose the diversity of their asset managers. Is that an oversight or is that just, I don't even know how to read into it. How do you read that? Well, the first thing to say is to draw the distinction between these endowments and other types of large institution investors, like say the pension funds, in, in that with, with the pension funds, they're quite constrained as to how far they can go in, in pursuing something like diversity because there's very clear um, fiduciary burden on the, the trustees of the, of the pension fund to make sure you, you have to be doing everything from a financial perspective and, and, and pursuing a goal um, beyond that, it, it can be quite difficult. The endowments have a little bit more flexibility because the, if the stakeholders, which would be the alumni and the, the school, um, are supportive, they perhaps can start to look at things like diversity and say, we will develop a policy of saying we want to encourage, whether it's the racially diverse owner owned companies, women owned companies, whatever it is, you, you have that freedom to pursue some of these policies that perhaps the pension funds don't. And so with that freedom to do it comes perhaps an expectation from some people that they'll say, well, I expect my school because you know, whichever school it is, it's probably one which supports diversity. And so why aren't you doing more? You know, why aren't you walking the walk as opposed to just yeah. talking the talk with your money? So that's the background. That the, It's something that most large investors don't do, but the endowments arguably have more freedom to do. Um, so then we have the question that you've just asked of why aren't they doing more of it? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess, you know, I, I it, you can't get in someone's mind or minds. You know, by, by the way, these are, as you know, but for the audience, these are teams of people. It's not just one, yeah. you know, John Doe or Jane Doe that's just managing all this money. I mean, just like, uh, you know, some the, the Harvard or Yale teams, they're like, or Princeton teams, they're like the most awarded teams in, in asset management, rewarded in terms of notoriety, but also in, um, in, in compensation. But, but Bob, I always, when I think of 
um, institutions, uh, education institutions, I always think about how progressive they are and how they've been on the front lines of a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, they're educating our future um, leaders, our future members of our community, our citizens, both here and also, by the way, in, in the UK and around the globe. So shouldn't they walk the walk that they're talking? Yes. And, and so what you find is that most of these endowments do pursue broader goals. They're, I mean, they're financially, they're very professional, as you say, especially, you know, the, the high profile, biggest names, the biggest organizations, they have strong staffs um, almost across the board. Um, so financially, they're really on the ball, but then they have these other goals that they, they can pursue. Now, no organization can pursue 20 goals at once. And, and so it, it can be quite difficult for them to say, well, where are we going to focus? Are we going to put diversity and, and trying to bring forward, you know, a, you're trying to improve the diversity of the investment industry by giving opportunities to people who perhaps might not have it? Um, or are we going to pursue other goals, you know, greater equality, um, obviously, there's lots of environmental goals they can follow and so on. So I, I think if, if you saw an organization which was trying to pursue every single goal that was a worthy cause, you, you'd, you'd be looking at an organization that probably isn't doing any of them very well. And, and so it, it is a, a challenge, I think, for them to decide where are we going to focus? And part of it is where do we think we can do most good? Where, where it, are we actually able to make a difference? Because in theory, oh, you've got these billions and billions of dollars, you can make a difference. In practice, you can be a lot more effective in certain spaces than you can in others. And, and so I think, it, you know, we shouldn't expect everybody to be doing kind of the everything that's possible in the diversity space. You certainly expect them not to be doing bad stuff. You expect them to have a certain minimum policy. But the types of policy that we're talking about here, which are quite progressive, as you say, in terms of seeking out minority owned um, asset managers and so on, that, that can be quite a big ask. It can be administratively quite difficult. You don't necessarily have um, the ability to put large amounts of money with them. So um, it's, it's great that some endowments feel able to do that, but you shouldn't be expecting everybody to, to be able to do what the, those leaders are doing. Yeah, really. And that, that's a really good f feedback. The other thing here, Bob, is that uh, to your point, it's not just the teams of managers. There are There's oversight, just like on a pension plan or a 401k plan here in the States, or maybe the Nest plan uh, where you are in the UK. There's boards of people that help direct a lot of this. So they come together. So like if, if I'm a student and I'm a student at one of these prestigious universities and I'm worried about the diversification of the asset management, a lot of these, lot of these decisions are funneled up through a board that has oversight, and they direct um, the asset manager, or excuse me, the uh, the team, how on what they're going to pursue, right? So it's not just, hey, we want to divest from fossil fuels, or we want diverse diversity in terms of our asset management, right? There, there, these are things that are decided upon by groups of people within the university. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I think. In a way, the the biggest power that any individual has, whether it's an individual student and, 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 and alumni, whatever, sometimes the biggest power you have is that power of being part of a movement. You know, one person writing a letter makes no difference um, in and of itself, but to the extent that encourages someone else to do it, and you tap into a sentiment that turns out, oh, it wasn't just one person that felt that, but a lot of people. That then starts to move the dial. It doesn't happen overnight, but I, I think it, it would be a, a mistake to think that you know, individuals need to try to carry the, the fight all on their own. But equally, it would be a mistake for them to think I'm powerless and I can't make a difference. It is really about the, the broader movement and tapping into um, what people want. I think that some of the changes that we're seeing in policies are in the areas where it's turned out there's a broader support than we realized for for some of the changes to be made so individuals have in the long term at least um quite significant power to cause change if, if they're serious yeah you know bob what i've learned through life is it's never zero one it's never black and white there's always shades of gray and you have to 
it's not an easy solution no matter where you come, no matter where you go on any particular issue. Bob Colley, we're going to have to leave it there. Great analysis. As always, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon, my friend. Thank you. Speak soon. That wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, somebody you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest security news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, we'll visit our website and, of course, our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN AM. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.